Saddleback, how we doing? If you are a first time guest with us today, my name is Pastor Rick Warren. If you're disappointed that uh, he's not speaking, so am I. So we're in the same boat. I'm so thankful for this place. Unbelievably grateful for what God has done through this movement here. Uh, my brother-in-law and closest friend uh, in the world trusted Christ through the Purpose Driven Movement. And so I, I was just reflecting on how eternally thankful I am for all of you and your faithfulness and what God is doing uh, through this ministry. I want to welcome you today. Welcome our 18 campuses tuning in. Uh, it is a gift to me to be here and read from the scriptures uh, with you. I want to start with a question that I want you to consider, it's simply this. Have you ever received a gift that you didn't want? Now be careful, because the giver might be beside you. So uh, just think about it. Have you ever received a gift that you didn't want? I, I personally, I love gifts. I, I love to receive them. Uh, I love to give them. Uh, I love gifts. And so every Christmas, my wife and I, we host this Christmas party where we bring in about 20 pastors. And through the year, I'll buy gifts, just different things I see on sale and that I think would bless them. And, uh, and so we do that gift exchange, you know, where, where everybody gets a number and you kind of go in order and you can open a gift from the middle or you can take one that's already been opened. You guys know that? that what's that game called? Okay, White Elephant, Dirty Santa, whatever it's called. Uh, we, play, we play that game, and uh, it's, it's funny because you have to really uh, kind of outline the rules because these pastors become incredibly unchristian when somebody <laughs> takes something from them that they wanted or, you know, the things don't go their way. And, and it's funny when they want to lose the gift because they're looking at something they're not going to use, so they want to lose the gift. And so somebody else will go, and they don't want to hurt my feelings because I've provided the gifts, but they're like, hey, man, did you see this? Man, this one looks so great in your house. What do you know? Don't go in the middle right here. Just take this one. You know, they want another chance. And, and so we play this game with a twist. Here's the twist. Is there's one gift in the middle that nobody wants. All right? Because it comes with a consequence. And so this year, the gift that nobody wants was this giant inflatable nutcracker. Okay? Giant inflatable nutcracker that you had to, if you open this gift, you're stuck with it. Nobody can take it from you. And you have to keep it on your front porch until March. <laughs> All right? Giant inflatable nutcracker. And so, uh, but it's not just any nutcracker. It's a redneck nutcracker. All right, here's what that means. It's got a giant beer belly, like this half shirt right here. It's missing teeth, handlebar mustache, snowflake tattoo, blue jean cutoff shorts, this giant inflatable nutcracker. And, uh, and so it's just like, this is going to be the gift that you see. Some of you are thinking, that just sounds like a Texas nutcracker, <laughs> which is hurtful. Uh, we'll reconcile that later. But um, so... Oh, I forgot, to, it's, it's just one other thing is it's holding this beer, like the, the nutcracker is, because nothing says the birth of our Savior like a cold one. And, and so this somebody, so my friend John Elmore opens this redneck nutcracker, he's stuck with it, and uh, he oversees our Celebrate Recovery ministry. <laughs> God has the best sense of humor. And, and I start with that because sometimes life gives you a gift that you want to lose, but you have to use. And you have to do something with it. You have a responsibility, a God-given responsibility to do something with it. We're in the second week of ordinary or everyday heroes. And today I wanna to talk about an everyday hero of mine. And it's, he's the Apostle Paul. He, he uh, is the greatest missionary that's ever lived. He's written about 80% of the New Testament. Uh, he's in large part responsible for you being here. He told somebody who 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 told you. And so here we are. And so I'm really thankful for the Apostle Paul. And he is a hero. When you think about superheroes like Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, they all have these gifts. You know, they all can do something, these superpowers. Well, did you know that Batman, Superman, uh, Wonder Woman and the Apostle Paul all had one of the same gifts. And no, the Apostle Paul couldn't fly. <laughs> they all have the gift of singleness. It's a gift that the scriptures call. And so today I want to talk with you about heroic singleness. 
which is not just seeking to lose the gift, but use the gift. And so half of my married friends just kind of rolled their eyes side and said, why did I come to church today? And I think that God has a message for you too. And so I want you to lean in, you need to hear this. Uh, and for my single friends, whether you've never married, whether you're divorced, widowed, uh, I want you to know that I know firsthand you are an incredibly port, important part of the church. You are a health engine for the church, a, a part of the church that is necessary. It's a part that Jesus used to change the world when we started this unstoppable force called the church. And so I need you to lean in and really hear this message because if there is a healthy church anywhere on the planet, it has a group of single people that are growing healthy and using their gift for the sake of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I've got a few disclaimers for you, so turn with me to 1 Corinthians 7. And as you do, I want you to know that the church has done such an incredible job of elevating marriage. I think that we've in, inadvertently said singleness is bad. We've said that marriage is so good and marriage is good. You need, do not need to email me saying, well, you made marriage not sound good. Let me just say it once for all. Marriage is good. Proverbs 18, 22, marriage is good. He who finds a wife finds what is good. I, I know marriage is good. Metaphor, it's good. Okay. Did you know singleness was good? The scripture says singleness is good. And if you didn't know that, then, then we got something that we need to learn. The second disclaimer I have for you this morning, I'm married. Been married for 12 years, got uh, three kids at home. I love my wife uh, very much. And so I know that if you're here and you're single, you're like, oh, here we go, another married guy telling me how awesome singleness is, you know? And I, I get that, I understand. But you need to know something. I spent the last 10 years of my life pouring into this demographic of the church. I've met with tens of thousands of single people that I've seen just getting after it. Literally, literally changing the world for the sake and the cause of Jesus Christ and his fame. And so I want to share that with you. And then thirdly, it's a little unnerving to come to a place this influential and just address half the crowd. But I'm not going to. Because this is a theology, an understanding of God's word that we all need. Married friends, we're not just part of the problem, you're a part of the solution. If you're here and you're a parent, let's be honest, you've always assumed your kids are going to get married. Maybe you've prayed for their spouse. Maybe you've talked to them about the future of what it's like to be married, and you never thought, what if God has the gift of singleness for them? And what that's done is you've not prepared them for that. Dads lean in when your 25-year-old daughter comes home from college, and there's no prospect in sight, and she feels like the Lord's now forsaken her. What theology are you going to give her at that point? So excited about this word as we move through 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to look at how everyday heroes view their relationship status as a gift, how everyday heroes live for another world, and how everyday heroes know why they are single. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes this letter from the, uh, from the Ephesus, uh, the church in Ephesus, the church he's founded. It's about 55 AD, and he's writing to the, the city of Corinth, the church in Corinth. And in this city, lots of things are going on. Nero is emperor. The, the temperature of Christian persecution is turning up. Uh, it is not popular to follow the way or Jesus Christ at this time. Nero's about to make persecution. Christians a sport, okay? And in Corinth, there's this temple, the temple of Aphrodite, where there's a thousand temple prostitutes. Could you imagine showing up to church and you sleep with a prostitute? That's how they worship. And so that's happening in the city. And there's this overcorrection that is occurring among the Christians where they write a letter to Paul and they say something along the lines of, well, it, it must not be even good for a man to have sex with a woman, and so Paul responds with something like, in summary, you should have sexual intimacy only with your own spouse by God's design. And then in verse 7 he says, but I wish all of you were as I am. What does he mean by that? His Facebook status is single. 
And so that's what he means there. He said, I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul sees his singleness as a gift. He makes that very, very clear here. My first point today, everyday heroes see their relationship status as a gift. He says that singleness is a gift. And so some of my single friends here, you think, well, cool. Does it come with a receipt? I mean, is it a gift I can exchange for another gift if I want? Like, what kind of gift is this? That's not seeing it as a gift. That's seeing it as a curse. As a curse. And so if you're thinking, you know, every time you get a wedding invite, you know, you throw something against the wall, you might have a perspective problem. If you're burning invitations with plus one options, you might have a perspective problem because Paul says it's a gift. And I know the world doesn't make it feel like it's a gift. And so I just want to say right here, the church, not this church, the big C church has failed you and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I know, I know that we've done that. And um, I know you've heard 100 married sermons to one like this, and I'm, and I'm sorry. And what an amazing gift that this church sees and understands the scripture, sees it as a value, and uh, desires to have a thriving single ministry, and so it's, it's a privilege to be with you guys. The essence of seeing something as a God-given gift is to realize the need to use the gift. The Greek word is charisma. It, it literally translates a gift given according to God's grace. And so you're here, and some of you are like, well, I wanna know if I have the gift of singleness, and I can tell you. I came all the way from Dallas, Texas, and I, can, I just have this incredible gift to be able to help people know if they have the gift of singleness with one question. I can ask you one question and tell you matter-of-factly, positive, I've never missed it, if you have the gift of singleness. And so I'll ask you the question. Did you wake up today single? Because if you did, you have the gift. Okay, it's that simple. And you're like, oh, wait, wait a minute. I thought it was like a permanent gift. No, the scripture doesn't say that. No, no, no. Today you have the gift of singleness. Is it permanent? Is it temporary? I don't know. God very rarely tells me a five-year plan. He usually just wants, you know, daily bread kind of faithfulness from people. And so he very rarely reveals the future to us. He just says, hey, I want you to go all in with me today, and I'll tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. But make sure that I'm your priority today. I don't know if it's permanent or temporary but if you're single today, you have the gift today. And so a hero is defined as someone who shows great courage. And I think it sh- takes today incredible courage to see your relationship status as a gift. Married people want to be single. And single people are seeking to be married or seeking to play married, to pretend like they're married. And Paul, he makes it clear that he sees singleness as a gift, even though he knows it means celibacy. He says if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. He doesn't say if they cannot control themselves, they should look at porn. If they cannot control themselves, they should have friends with benefits. If they cannot control themselves, they should move in together. If they cannot control themselves, they should play married. That's not what he says. He makes it really clear there's two categories. There's there's married people who enjoy the gift of sexual intimacy, and there's single people who practice self-control. I think it's very clear his preferred gift is singleness. And I think he sees it as a gift for two reasons. Number one, the Apostle Paul was all about the kingdom, man. He is all about building the kingdom and advancing the gospel. And he knows that he can do that better, easier by himself. Not by himself in community with other brothers and sisters, but not married. And so that's his preferred gift. And so listen, uh, I I grew up in the church, uh, went to church twice a week most of my life, Uh, went to a church school for nine years, Uh, went through True Love Waits, I was in a part of this youth ministry, teen time, you know, all of that stuff. And then I go to college and I fail miserably. I ran from God as hard and as fast as I can. And what that looked like for me 
was I, I engaged in relationships in ways I said I never would have. Multiple sexual partners. I, I was partying alcohol. Felt like the first five years of college I was drunk. Experimented with drugs. And I began to feed an addiction to pornography that would completely own me. And every night I'd say my prayers. And one particular night I'm in my twin size bed in my campus apartment and I'm praying to God and I just start weeping. I start sobbing. Like God's not listening to me. Nobody hears me. And the next day I called someone that I looked up to because they were successful and popular and and I just started pouring out my sins to them. I'm like, this is what I've done, and this is what I've done, and this is what I've done, and I can't believe it. And I'm, I mean, I grew up in the church, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this. And they just said, yeah, it's just kind of what you do when you're single. They said, you do that, and then later on, you settle down and get married, and you get right with God. That's terrible advice. <laughs> Think about what that advice cost me. I, I wasn't using a gift. I was abusing a gift. I was wasting a gift, and I don't know how that made the giver feel, but it wasn't good. See, the second reason Paul sees his singleness as a gift is because he trusts the giver. He knows that God gives good gifts. Remember in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says the Father only gives good gifts to his children. And so if we know, if we trust the giver, then we can see what we have as a gift. We can trust him and wait for it. See, my, I, I was a part of another gift exchange uh, this one is annual gift exchange with my in-laws, my wife's family. Uh, it's at, at one of her aunt's house, in, incredibly dysfunctional, uh, usually turns physical at some point. And uh, there's a $15 limit, which is part of the problem because there's always someone that brings like a $25 gift card and then someone that brings something that was homemade. And, and so there's just like lots of things going on. And, and my, my, uh, her uncle, who's a really good guy, uh, brought this one gift, and my brother-in-law got stuck with it, and it was a stopwatch. It was in this old box, and he opened it up as a plastic stopwatch, and he's like, this thing doesn't even work. Like, what are you thinking? You know, and this tempers flare, and, and I, I said, and he got stuck with it, and I said, hey, can I see that? And he said, you, can you, sure, you can have it. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, you can have it. It's a broken stopwatch. Take it. And so I took it, I looked at it, I looked it up on eBay. It turns out it's a Tag Heuer, limited edition, Olympic stopwatch, used in the Olympics. I sold it for $150 before I left the party. Because <laughs> I thought, you know what, your uncle's a good guy. If he gave you a broken stopwatch, there's got to be a reason to it. There has to be some valuable, some way to use that thing. So I want you to trust the giver. If what you have is not good, then God is not done or your perspective is off. If what you have right now is not good, then God's not done or your perspective may be off. James 1, uh, 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of heavenly lights. He gives us good gifts and he doesn't change like shifting shadows. So listen, friends, I understand marriage is good. It is. And marriage is a metaphor. It teaches about Christ and how he loves the church. I know Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 and 1 Peter 3. I understand marriage is this incredible metaphor. Did you know what singleness teaches us? Singleness teaches us about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. A person who is single and content in their relationship with Christ teaches us about the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. That person's life screams that he is enough, that Jesus is enough. And so both marriage and singleness are gifts, and the giver is good, and the giver can be trusted. Verse 28, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. Well, that's really good news. But if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you of this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. 
Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. And those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. What? That's one of those passages you read and you're like, I don't know. God will explain it later. The key to understanding this passage is this last sentence. Live as though time is short, he starts with, and he says, for this world in its present form is passing away. That everything that the world says is important here, everything that the world tempts you to worship here, is passing away. It may not, the things that matter most right now may not matter 600 years from now. So my second point is that everyday heroes live for another world. Everyday heroes live for another world. Think about Superman and Wonder Woman, how they they come here from another land and they're on a mission here to do something, usually for the other land, to accomplish some things. This is us, friends. This is how we live life. We do not love the world or the things of the world. We live for another world. And so this is what Paul is saying. Our time here on earth is short. So he simply says, so as you mourn, it's okay to mourn. God made you an emotional being. It's okay to experience sadness. But don't mourn like those who don't have hope. You have hope. So mourn with hope. And it's okay to be happy. It's okay to want to be happy. It's okay to experience happiness. But don't make happiness your idol. And don't make happiness your idol. Understand that there's another happiness that's, that's an eternal joy that's so much greater than any happiness you're going to experience here. In fact, when you laugh here until you cry, just that deep, <laughs> you're with friends and you're elation, you experience true happiness. It's merely a sample of what's to come. It's a commercial of an eternal joy that's waiting for you. And he says, just make sure you have that perspective. And when you buy things here, it's okay to have things. It's okay to have nice things that you can enjoy, but understand those things make terrible idols. Do not worship them. Rust and moth are going to destroy those things. You cannot take them with you. The only thing that is eternal is God, his word, and his people. And that's why he says, live as though you're not married. He's saying something really key. I want you to get this. Everybody, you gotta get this. Understand that you have an eternal family. Look around you, wherever you're at, look around you. And you're seeing your eternal family. Those are people you're gonna be with forever. 600 billion years from now. Oh man, remember Saddlebag, that was crazy. (laughs) Man, you go, yeah, we were there. It was a beautiful campus. Remember when they brought in the tall, goofy guy? You'll probably never say that. But just remember, there's this, this gonna be this, this eternal reunion of your church family, your eternal family, because you know no one's married up there. Oh, some of your minds were just blown. <laughs> no, 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 Jesus said that. No one's married or given in marriage. You remember he, he said that? That we go up there and it's like, we begin to see the eternal family, the family that we're gonna be with forever. That's Matthew twenty-two thirty. 30. But remember what happens in Matthew 12? They come up to Jesus and they're like, hey, Jesus, hey, yo, your mom's outside. And he's like all confused. They're like, my mom's outside. What are you talking about? And then they're confused. They're like, yo, your mom's outside. What's the big deal? He's like, no, man. These are my brothers and sisters. These are my mother. Don't you understand that those who do the will of my father, that that's my family? Oh, you're talking about my earthly family. Oh, man, yeah, I love those guys. This is my family. How you doing, family? How you doing, fam? So don't make marriage your idol. Don't make any relationship your idol. And I understand. He who finds a wife finds what is good. Proverbs 18, 22. I know, God, I know marriage is good. But with marriage comes trouble. Can I get an amen? Oh, come on, man. Some of you were too loud on that amen. That's... <laughs> I didn't mean to start that. (laughs) You gotta gotta soften that amen. Like, amen, because you asked me to, and only because you asked me to. (laughs) It is, though, but I mean, think about it, right? Like, I know so many single friends that that believe, listen, listen to this, they think all their problems are gonna be solved 
if they just got married. <laughs> Single friends, do you hear the laughter? <laughs> married people know better. Like some of you, you get an argument today. Like before you came here. I know what it looked like. Husband's on the couch. Hey, babe, we're going to be late. She's like, will you help me? Get the kids ready or something? Yeah, babe, just whatever you need me to do. What do you need me to do? What I need you to do is get off the couch and look what needs to be done, okay? And then you go in the car and it's still back and forth. And We're late and it's your fault. No, it's your fault. And then you get here and you're trying to check the kids in the kids' ministry and it's just chaotic. And meanwhile, your single friends are walking by with a Starbucks and a smile. They're like, you look stressed. You guys okay? Can we, we you need some help? Some I can work this out? It's hard. And with marriage comes trouble. Think about, think about this. Entertain me here. Imagine if, um, imagine if right now there's this fleet of helicopters outside. Fleet of helicopters, they're waiting for you because I just got, you know, Rick, let's say Pastor Rick just reached out and said, hey, there's this opportunity in Syria, the government, they said we can go, but we got to go right now. And we're going to be there for a year because once we get in, we can't get out and we're going to go. We got to be there for a year. We need some missionaries to go with us. They're saying there's a, we've got an in with the government. They said we can tell them about Jesus. They're going to protect us. And, and, and you we're going to provide everything that you need and you're even going to get paid. But you got to get on a helicopter right now and you're going to be gone for a year. Who could go? My single friends could go. World changers, let's go. Let's rock. I'm in. I'm in. And so when he's saying, he says, you know, if you're married, live as though you're not. What he's really saying is that single people are the picture in the church. They set the pace of what full devotion to Jesus looks like. They are our example or should be. According to the Apostle Paul, that's really what he's saying is, is they, should, they should be the perfect picture of fully plugged in, completely engaged, surrounded by a small group, contributing, using their gifts to serve, using their talents and their treasures to contribute. And you look and you're like, okay, who is like the, the icon token member of Saddleback? You, you would just say, well, this single person and there's this single person and there's this single person. That they would be the picture of full devotion to us. Man, when I'm talking about heroes, there's so many people come to my mind. I think about my friend Cheryl. She's 43, never married. Every time I see her, she's coming and going from talking to somebody, talking with somebody about Jesus. And not just locally, like she's traveling here and there and always going somewhere. Like I'm like, I saw her the other day. I'm like, Cheryl, where you been? She's like, oh man, two weeks, seven airports. I went here to talk about Jesus and there to talk about Jesus and here to talk about Jesus. Sounds like she's never available, but the truth is she's always available. She's constantly at our church, constantly serving. She's like an extension of our staff without the hit to our payroll. I mean, she's just constantly giving herself. I think about my friend. Mo. I think about my friend Mo, also in his 40s, single guy, never married. Uh, when the Haiti, when, when there was an earthquake that hit Haiti, Mo goes, grabs a backpack with a change of clothes and goes to the airport. He's like, I'm going. I'm going to figure out a way to get in. I'll be there as long as I need to be there. I'm just going to help people. It's just what he does. I, in fact, I saw him the other day. I'm like, hey Mo, where have you been? I just wrote it down so I could share with you. He said, oh man, where have I been? Oh, you know, I was in northern Uganda and I was helping um, build an economy uh, with some other single friends. Oh, I was in Ethiopia sharing the gospel with Muslims. Oh, I went to South Sudan. Uh, I was helping those impacted by war heal with Christ. I was in northern Iraq working with Samaritan Purse. I was in Jordan, Turkey, and Iran documenting refugee camps, loving, uh, serving people in the name of Jesus. Went to the Congo the other day. I was helping people recover from war and, and sharing the gospel. <laughs> some of you married people are jealous. You're like, I wish I could do that. It's hard with marriage. It's hard when you're married. And you think, well, man, that's cool for your missionary friend. No, he's got a full-time job in Dallas. It's just how he uses his vacation days. Like, when Chris reached out to me, it's been so much fun just to be here. 
since yesterday and meet with hundreds of single friends out there. And uh, man, Chris, you guys have some incredible leadership here in your singles ministry. And I sense that God's doing something really incredible. When he reached out and he was like, hey, I'd love for you to come and, and share with us about this. I was like, Chris, I'd love to, man, but my, my daughter's at camp. I've got to pick her up. You know, I haven't seen her for a week. I just don't know. You know, I've got, I got a lot, I mean, I've got married and kids and it's hard to just get away. In fact, I had to ask my 10-year-old daughter for permission. I'm like, hey, when, when mommy picks you up from camp, is it okay if daddy's not there? Uh, there's a church in California that has asked me to come and she looked at me and she said, daddy, I think you have a message for them. <laughs> we both know that's not true, but God, hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully God does, right? Hopefully God does. I, I think about when I became a Christian, you know, I went, I went to, to Africa. I was uh, teaching, got to teach, had the opportunity to teach the government there, and, and then I was in Brazil in the jungles of the Amazon, and then in Haiti uh, caring for people and, and sharing the gospel there. And then when I got married and we started our family, like I think about, like, I haven't been anywhere. I, like, well, I went to Haiti that one trip, but I had to abbreviate it because there was a soccer tournament. It's just like life just gets really, really crazy. And so I think about heroes. Heroes like my friend Suzanne. Everyday heroes, everyday faithfulness. It's not just about traveling the world and, and being Jesus' hands and feet. Like she just serves in our kids' ministry. Never had kids of her own, never even adopted, moving past the age where she can. But she's the mother to thousands of kids. She loves every week. When somebody's in the hospital, she goes and visits them, constantly feasting on God's word and teaching it to others. Everyday faithfulness from everyday hero like her. Heroes like Mother Teresa, who never married but gave her life to serving lepers in Calcutta. Heroes like Amy Carmichael, who opened an orphanage and founded a mission in India. Heroes like Corey Tim Boom, who helped the Jews escape the Holocaust. Heroes like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that when he was going to protect the world from Nazi Germany and try to overthrow Hitler's regime, he began to recruit people. But he had a requirement. You had to be single. I think of C.S. Lewis most of his life, Eric Little, and a, a long list of people who paved a way for the gospel so that we could gather here like this. And what I'm trying to tell you, if you're here and you're single and you're using that gift for the sake of the kingdom to further the gospel and to, to make, increase the fame of Jesus Christ. If you're here, I want you to know something. You are my hero. I'm so thankful for you. I am so incredibly thankful for you. Please continue in that example for the rest of us. And if you're here and you're like me and you're going to the bars or like I was, going to the bars, going to the clubs, trying to be a millionaire before you're 30 or whatever that is and just completely giving all of your life to corporate America, I want you to know something, man, you got a gift and you're wasting it. And God has something so much better for you. So much, such a better life. A more purposeful life for you. And I want you to know something, single friends, you're not incomplete. It's crazy. Jerry Maguire madness, what is that? You're complete in Christ. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. He, gave his, he died for all of your sins. God raised him from the dead. And if you trust in him, right? And by the way, can I tell you something about Jesus you may not have known? He was single the most complete human being ever to walk the planet Earth, did the most ministry anybody could have done, accomplished the greatest task that anybody could imagine was a single man. Verse 32. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good. No, I'm not saying this to restrict you guys. But that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion 
to the Lord. Some say they're single for a season. Some say they're single for a reason. What I want you to know is every single person you know is single for a reason. The scripture makes that really clear. My third and final point is everyday heroes understand that they are single for a reason. And I'm not talking about you're too flirty or you come on too strong or you don't dress right or you don't get paid enough or you don't have the right job. I'm not talking about you don't do enough CrossFit, okay? That's not what we're talking about, not even bad breath or BO. I'm talking about you're single so that you might live a life in full devotion to the Lord today. That if you're single today, that that's what life is to look like, that you would belong to his church, that you would serve, that you would contribute there, that you would, that you would belong to a small group, that you would push through the incredible difficulties of two sinners or multiple sinners hanging out together, relationships get hard that you would continue to give that a shot, that you belong, that that is what the heroic single life looks like. And I know some of you are thinking, man, it sounds like the Apostle Paul was just bitter. Like maybe the Holy Spirit kind of turned his head for a moment and Paul just started writing real fast, venting about how terrible it is to be single and I'm gonna trick a bunch of people into being it with me, you know. No, it's inspired by God. It's God-breathed. And, and can I tell you something crazy? Maybe you didn't know. Do you know Paul's just, this is just commentary on the words of Jesus. Do you remember that? Matthew 19. Remember when they, they come up to Jesus and they're talking to him about marriage. And, and Jesus is like, man, marriage is permanent. And they're like, Wait, hold on. What do you mean by permanent? And he's like, Permanent. And then the disciples are like, Wait, well, you mean like permanent, permanent? Like, because if it's permanent, I mean, who, who can get married? And he says this, he says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way. What is a eunuch? It's where we get the word unicorn. No, it's not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's not. Uh, I made that up. Um, a eunuch is someone without Uh, reproductive parts usually made that way by kings so that they can watch over their harem and not be tempted by the women of this time and so where there are eunuchs who are born that way and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others he's using this as an illustration to say this this is where I want you to hear me and then there are those who choose to live like eunuchs so they're not eunuchs but they choose to live a celibate life for the sake of the kingdom of heaven And then he says this crazy thing. The one who can accept this should accept it. Huh. And so I'm trying to challenge you to use your singleness. Jesus is. Paul is. God is. My friend John, when he got that crazy nutcracker, went home and put it up. And, you know, December, fine. January, fine. Uh, February, neighbors come knocking, angry. And they're like, hey, can we talk about HOA a little bit, you know? <laughs> and and uh, he's like, well, let me tell you a story. And he, and he tells them about, you know, how he got the gift. And they laughed. It's a funny story. And, and then he says, can I tell you about another gift? The free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And he used it as a bridge to share the gospel with his angry neighbors. And Jehovah's Witness and Mormons came by and, and uh, you know, it's kind of non-threatening to have that on the front of your house. And and so he just got to engage them. I know we believe a lot of the same things. Can I tell you about this one thing? This was a gift, and here's another gift. It's the free gift of grace. And then there was this magazine salesman that came by, and he was like intimidated, knocking on doors, and he's like, that guy must have a good sense of humor. I'm going there. And so he, he goes in, and he sees the big redneck nutcracker, knocks on the door, and, and John tells him the story and, and then shares Christ with him and And the guy uh, begins to explore a relationship with Jesus. And John used his gift. He didn't just seek to lose the gift, he used the gift. And you you think about that person who told me, well, you just, that's what you do when you're single. You just kind of live your life and then you settle down when you're married. And, And I think about the crazy, I think about how I fed that addiction to pornography. I think about how I poisoned my heart that wouldn't just be undone quickly. I hate that. I hate that that happened. And then later on, I was at a bar, 
and I saw another friend and they invited me to a church and I went and I sat in the back row hungover. I smelled like smoke from the night before and I began to wrestle with what do I really believe about God? I always said I believed in Jesus but I've never lived like I have. And I, I realized that 2017 years ago Something happened that reset the calendar that every atheist I know acknowledges Jesus by the date they put on their checks. And I gave my life to him and the Holy Spirit came in my life and began to allow me to experience healing. I, I plugged into a church, I became a member, came under the authority of the leaders there. I got plugged into a small group and those guys started helping me heal from my addiction to pornography with the help of the Holy Spirit. I healed from the alcoholism and the drug use, and God began to give me a new purpose and allow me to use the gift of the season that I was in. And that's what he wants from you and from everyone. This is the message of the scriptures here. And so heroic singles see their relationship status as a gift. Heroic singles live for another world. And heroic singles understand the reason they are single. It's, it's interesting, you know. I know marriage is good. Like if we took all the verses on marriage in the scripture, it would probably be like that. Right there. Singleness is also good. It's, you know, the Apostle Paul, a lot of scholars, most scholarship thinks that he was married at one point. But we don't know. It's interesting that we have this guy who wrote so much and, and his texts have been preserved, but we don't know if he was married. It's because there was another relationship that was ultimate to him that he spent a lot of time writing about. Let me try to explain to you what I mean. I'll close with this. My four-year-old, <laughs> I wish you could meet him. He's a trip. Uh, Weston is his name. He, he got home from preschool the other day. And he's like, Daddy, can we talk? <laughs> sure, buddy. He's like, Daddy, no, no, come and sit down. He points to the couch. I'm like, all right, I sit down. And he looks at me and he says, Daddy, I'm going to marry Isabella. <laughs> Four. I'm like, how much do you want to bet? It's like he's saying, Daddy, now I know what relationship matters. And you kind of do that your whole life. Like, it's cute when you're four. How about when you're 40, you know? And all the times in between, like, like when you're in the sixth grade, for example, and, and guys start to notice girls, like they no longer have cooties, and, and girls start to think about what they're wearing and making sure that it matches, and they look good in their hair, and they smell good and all that. And there's this weird stuff that happens, and they're at a dance, you know, and girls are over here, and boys are over here. But if you ever make it here, it's like, I know what relationship matters most now. And then you go to high school, and there's prom and there's homecoming and you start to see heartbreak. And you start to see the pain of relationships breaking up and you start to think, you know what, now I know what relationships really matter. Like this is, this is important stuff. And then you go to college and you look back on all of that and it's just kind of silly. And you've got fraternities and sororities and you're like, man, now I know what relationship really matters. You have these long conversations on a park bench or on the telephone. You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> No, you hang up. And then you get in the real world and, and the stakes get a lot higher because you're like, man, any loser I might go on a date with might be my forever loser. And so I really know what relationships matter now. And then maybe you find yourself at an altar with a minister, bridesmaids and groomsmen, and you're standing there and you're making these crazy promises to each other. And you're like, now I know what relationships really matter. And then maybe, God willing, you have children and you're like, now I know what relationships matter. And maybe it's grandchildren for you. All of the fun of parenting, none of the pain. And you're like, now I know what relationships matter. And for you, maybe it's a pet or a best friend. I don't know what relationships you're tempted to idolize. But what, why I came here today is to tell you that one day, very soon, much sooner than you think, you're going to die. And you're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, what's going to happen is this revelation of now I know what relationship really matters. Now I know what matters. And if there's any regret, if there's any regret in that moment, you're going to look back, if, there, if that's even possible, on all those other relationships, and you're going to like, I wish I would have lived all those relationships for this relationship, because this one matters. And nobody gets there 
Nobody ever in the history of history grits there. I'm like, Jesus, let's talk. Did you not see that I was single? You didn't want to do something about that? Jesus, I was down there. I was 33 years old and single. He's just going to be like, I can relate. <laughs> so was I. Here's my question for you. When did Jesus stop being enough? Like some of us, we just got to start there. Like, hey, Jesus, you're not enough. I need you and my spouse. I need you in this relationship. I need you and you to bring somebody to me. You're not enough. There's a discontentment in me that's so big, it's grown bitterness. And I'm benched in the church. I'm not being utilized. I'm not serving. I'm not used. I'm not being used. I'm not your hands and feet. Would you change that today? Would you go all in? Would you belong? Would you come? Would you serve? All right, let me pray that you would. Father, we love you. We thank you so much just for the words of your servant, Paul. Thank you just for this crazy reality that we can learn about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ through our single friends. And, and, and I pray that you'd stir in their hearts that they would be the icon of full devotion to Christ and the church. And I pray for my married friends that they would learn your word and teach it to others, instruct it to others, that discipleship would happen. And thank you for Saddleback, God, for the example of a church that says, this is so important to us. We want to spend a weekend talking about it. Would you multiply their kind throughout our country and our world? And would you continue to allow these people not just to be consumers of good messages and great worship, but to be the actual church when they leave here and go into their communities and into their, their businesses, that they would be truly the hands and feet of Jesus, passionate about sharing Christ and living out the gospel. Father, you're so kind to us. Thank you for your grace and the gift of whatever season you have us in. Would you help us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit to see it as a gift? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.